All right, here we go. Hi, my name is Brian Hines. I'm the Communications Manager at Biomed. I want to thank you all for joining today's session. Well, we are going to reveal the 2020 Biomed Phytogenic Feed Additive Survey results to you. I'm joined today by our featured speaker, Dr. Antonia Tacconi, the Global Product Line Manager for Phytogenics at Biomed. Dr. Tacconi, thank you for joining. You're very welcome and thank you for having me. It's, of course, our pleasure. Uh, before we get started, you know, you and I have worked together for many years now. Uh, but for those of us listening and for the viewers who are going to catch the recording later, why don't you tell us a few words about yourself, how long you've been in Biome, and what sure. you do? So I joined uh, Biomin uh, four years ago as a product manager in um, assets. And uh, from that position onward, then I moved to uh, global product line uh, management for assets. And finally, to global product line management for phytogenics just uh, around two years ago. Um, my background is more on the biotechnology side. So I uh, graduated uh, here at the University uh, in Vienna, Boku, uh, in uh, biotechnology and food technology. And then I did my PhDs in uh, bioanalytics. I really enjoyed uh, working for Biomin, having the possibility to explore more than just uh, one product line. And um, yeah, that's in very short and a uh, few words what I'm actually doing in Biomin. All right, well, thank you for that overview. Um, so uh, for our live listeners, I just want to point out that uh, we do have a chat function here. If you have any questions for Dr. Tacconi, uh, as the presentation continues, uh, we're going to try to answer some of those. Um, at, at different points throughout the presentation and then for a dedicated question and answer session at the end. So please go ahead and if something pops up, uh, just type it in there and we will try to get to your question either during this session or later on. Uh, now, Antonia, as we get started here, um, could you first introduce us to the world of phytogenics? What are we talking about here? Um, can you describe these uh, feed additives what they do uh, and where they come from. Yeah, I know there is uh, sometimes a lot of confusions around uh, phytogenic feed additives in general. When we talk about them, we're talking about secondary metabolites from uh, plants. And uh, the difference between uh, the secondary metabolites and the primary metabolites is that um, uh, the secondary metabolites are produced by uh, the plant cell through metabolic pathways deriving from the primary metabolic pathways. So we're talking about the amino acid production, sugar and lipids that then are further metabolized into other compounds. The difference is that uh, uh, the primary metabolites are widely distributed in nature. They occur virtually in all organisms. Uh, they are in plants often centralized in seeds and storage organs and they are needed for the physiological development of such plants. Why, when we talk about uh, the secondary metabolites, we're talking about uh, uh, products that um, are encoded by specific genetic material that are, it's activated only in specific situations. And uh, so they are not needed directly for the physiological development of the plant, but they play a different uh, role. So if we look at uh, why the plants are producing such secondary metabolites, Usually it's because they need protection against uh, both abiotic and biotic stress. So in this case, for example, we're talking about heat stress, we're talking about uh, um, humidity, uh, a lot of rain and, uh, and so on. They also are needed for the defense of the plants, especially when it comes to um, um, other uh, organisms or other herbivores that are there. So we're talking about, uh, for example, effects like repellents, toxicity, but also uh, growth inhibition when it comes directly to microbes. And also um, when the plants need to compete with the other plants for the space uh, to grow. And so here inhibition of germination, but also of uh, seedling growth. So that's mainly why um, the secondary metabolites are produced. And uh, that's also why when we're talking about phytogenic feed additive, it's very difficult um, to give just one mode of action for, uh, for those compounds because uh, they were produced for different, um, for different uh, effects. And so also when we're using them in, in the animals, 
we are actually expecting to have some specific effects, whether it's because of um, antioxidant effect, anti-inflammatory effect, or direct growth inhibition effect on some microbes and so on. So we also need to be very well aware of these differences when we are considering to use phytogenic feed additives in our feeds. Um, there are many, many different classes of secondary metabolite. I don't want to talk too much about it because it's, it's a very difficult topic to discuss. Um, they can be classified according the, to the plant or the synthesis pathway of those compounds, but also um, they can be classified according um, their chemical structure. And so we have, uh, this is, let's say, the easiest way to classify them. And there are some major classes like phenolic metabolites, but also alkaloids, saponins, and terpenes. And uh, we think, okay, that's just a, a class. But for example, if we look into um, the terpenes, um, you can see that there are a lot of different uh, um, structures also in this small group or this, this major class that we're talking. So we can start with a hemiterpene or a, a monoterpenoid, three terpenes, but we can go up to um, compounds that actually include, uh, let's say, more than four, 40 C carb, uh, carbon items. So very complex structures. And uh, because they are so different between um, themselves, also in the small groups of the terpenes, we can have very, very different mode of action. So it's a very complex topic here. And uh, we really need to pay attention when we're trying to um, select the right phytogenic feed additive for our feeds. Great, yeah, thank you for that introduction to the topic. Um, could you give us a, a couple of examples of some of the most commonly used substances that are included in these feed additives and which plants do they come from? So I would say like one of the most known um, combination of phytogenic feed additive that is used is for, for example, the essential oil of uh, oregano species. Um, so here we're talking about oregano vulgare, or we can also talk about uh, the plant Timbra capitata. So all of this falls under the category of oregano essential oil. And uh, here, for example, we have a combination of uh, ex um, very large amount of uh, phytochemicals in these oils. And the most known that one are, for example, cavacrol and um, thymol and so on. Uh, but also we know we're talking about, um, uh, so it's not just about essential oils, but we also have other extracts. So extracts that can be done by water, but also by um, other solvents, like for example, ethanol or so on. And uh, these extracts are also very well known, for example, if we consider grapeseed extracts or licorice extracts. And the mode of action of, the, of the, uh, all these extracts can be uh, very different. So oregano oil is very well known to be a pathogen uh, inhibitor, has also some anti-inflammatory effects. While when you consider, for example, a licorice extract, we know that here we have antioxidative and anti-inflammatory effects, so a bit of a different mode of action. So let's get into the 2020 Biomed Phytogenic Feed Additive Survey results. Um, just looking at the, the, the top line numbers here, 669 respondents from 79 different countries. Uh, and it's not the first time that Biomed uh, conducts this survey. Uh, could you remind us why uh, does Biomed conduct this effort and, and what do you hope to gain from it? So, um... As you already mentioned, it's not the first time we do this uh, phytogenic feed additive survey. Survey We did one back in 2017, then one back in 2018. And uh, for us, it's very important not only to understand what are our customers uh, using and what kind of uh, expectations they have when using such products, but also for us, it's important to understand um, how can we like steer our research in the right direction also to help our customer understand better such uh, products, but also to steer our future developments. So um, trying to uh, identify those uh, challenges and those um, uh, particular um, requests that are coming from our customers so that we can uh, better um, help um, them with their challenges and the problems they're facing with the best available products. Great. So can you tell us a bit more about these nearly 700 respondents from across the globe? Who are they? What do they do? Why were their opinions captured here? Yeah, so um, we have here, as you already mentioned, um, 669 respondents from 79 countries. 
um, that completely complete, completed this survey uh, during a seven-week period, um, and the period ended in January 2020. So uh, still pre-COVID uh, uh, situation, but I think that uh, anyhow, um, those data are very representative. And we can see that actually we got views from veterinarians, nutritionists, but also um, academics, business owners, CEOs, um, sales people in general, and consultants. So this was uh, the biggest part of the respondents. And then it goes down also to feed meal manager, formulators, and so on. So quite a diverse uh, respondent um, background we have here. And uh, looking at the regions as such, we had uh, we uh, did this survey on a global level. The majority of our respondents were from Latin America with 38%, directly followed uh, by Asia and Oceania. And um, uh, we had an 18% of respondents from Europe, Middle East and Africa, and about 7% uh, from the United States and Canada. In uh, general, uh, we asked uh, all of the respondents if uh, they were using uh, or directly involved in feed ingredients purchase decision. And 75% uh, of the respondents actually uh, answered yes, which means that uh, um, a lot of our respondents are actually directly involved um, into uh, the decision-making process when it comes to feed ingredients in um, their operations. Also, when we look at uh, what kind of sectors we were targeting, we can see that the majority uh, comes out of the consultancy um, um, group, but also poultry production was very well uh, represented here. Research, uh, so the academic uh, group was also represented and then feed meal also with 12.6%. And then finally, we had a smaller uh, amount of uh, people coming from free mix uh, distribution additive producers, uh, but also uh, ruminant swine and aquaculture markets were uh, represented. All right. Thank you for that overview of those demographics. Now that we know the, the pool of respondents a bit better, oh, what is it they said? What were their opinions? So, um, of course, for us, it was also important to understand whether or not they are using phytogenic feed additives in their operations. So, and um, I'm very pleased about this. 52% of the respondents uh, are currently using or were back in January currently using phytogenic feed additives. We had 38% uh, of our respondents that uh, said that uh, uh, they never used those and then a 10% um, um, saying that they were previously using them but then stopped using them. And if we look into what kind of products or let's say what kind of um, of um, um, yeah, available mix or mixtures they are using. The majority um, respondents say that they are applying commercially available mixed products, where only a very small percentage, um, so here we are talking about 11%, is using uh, own blends of oils and herbs or a combination of both own blends and commercially available uh, products. Um, it is um, there is an important reason for this, in my opinion, why uh, most of, of the respondents are actually relying on the commercially available products is because those products are usually science-based, which means that the, de the development of such products is um, uh, the result of extensive research uh, in order to address the best possible way um, a specific challenge or in order to influence in the best possible way specific key performance parameter in different uh, phases of animal production. But uh, one of the, let's say, um, most important advantages of commercially available products is that uh, those products are standardized. And this means that uh, a customer can be sure that uh, when he's uh, buying and using those products, uh, there is no or very little batch to batch variation. So he can be sure that whenever he's using them, he will get uh, always similar results in terms of, um, of um, uh, performance in, in the animals. Would you happen to have an example of, of how those, um, those raw materials on the input side uh, need to be controlled, what standards would look like? Yeah, so it's it's really important because here we're talking about the natural compounds, right? And um, so um, they are derived from plants. And uh, the concentration of the secondary metabolites of which we talked before 
can vary a lot and um, the concentration can depend uh, um, on the harvesting period so for example whether i'm i'm harvesting the plant after uh, the flourishing so after the plant already had flowers or if i'm doing it before because of course there there will be different uh, secondary metabolite produced in the different uh, phases of the life of the plant but also um, external factors like for example um, the rain or, or um, the country where I'm actually uh, growing those plants can have an effect on that. And also the soil on which I'm growing those plants have a very, has a very strong effect on um, changing the content of such secondary metabolites. Which means that um, um, here I just brought an example about, uh, for example, mental content on different mint oils. So um, if you are working with commercially available products, they will make sure that they have a quality acceptance range for a specific compounds. And in this case, we're talking about menthol here in the, um, here if we look at, the, at this image. So if we consider that uh, we're looking at the menthol and usually we do this uh, via GCMS, uh, MS, so we see an intensity peak for that specific compound. Um, what we see is that uh, depending on the oil that I'm buying, I might be into my quality acceptance range, but I also might be even higher or even lower. So if I get oils that are not in my quality acceptance range, I need to reject them. Otherwise, I will have problem with the uh, final product itself because then it's not stable. It's not a stable product and my customer would not get always the same. And this we do for most of the um, uh, compounds we are using, let's say uh, the most important phytochemicals contained in oils or also in extract, we are usually testing them and making sure that we always have the same amount in our final products. So now we see that um, there is a group of uh, producers on the animal protein and, and feed and premix side of, of the industry who are using phytogenic feed additives. We see the commercial option. Uh, commercially formulated ones are by far the most popular. Um, how are they being applied? What can you tell us there? Yeah, so it's always very important to understand how customers apply the phytogenic feed additives because um, it will also uh, tell us like on which sector we need to focus, but also which sector maybe we need to um, uh, explore a bit uh, uh, deeper. And as you can see here, most of our uh, respondents were answering that the phytogenic feed additives are applied either via feed or via premix. Only a very small amount um, suggested that they're using it in micro and macro mineral uh, or in the drinking water. So um, it's quite interesting to see that uh, anyhow, like the largest group of phytogenic feed additives is applied via feed or premix. Uh, however, there is still a lot of potential for application in drinking water and a lot of potential. Uh, for other application that we need to explore. Yeah, that's great. Uh, would there be any reasons uh, to prefer one method of, of application versus another? Are there any benefits? You mentioned drinking water um, seems to be the, the, the smaller or less common uh, In, uh, ven venue this way. Yeah, in, uh, in my honest op opinion, there should be um, a reason why I'm applying in one way or the other. I mean, when we're talking about uh, the application of phytogenic feed additives in feed or premixes, what we see is that uh, uh, these are usually applied in a preventive way, which means I cannot just start applying them when I have when I have the problem, but I need to start applying them before. And why? Because of course the um, the concentration of those compounds is a bit lower when we give them via feed because we don't want to influence the taste of the feed too much. But if we're trying to look for an intervention, so we, we really have a challenge, for example, um, an, a challenge with pathogens. In this case, the best way uh, to apply is uh, the drinking water, because there I can apply with a higher concentration of the product, and I can make sure that uh, the animal uh, gets it immediately via drinking. So um, there is also a difference in the, in the application of the products and I need to consider what kind of challenge am I facing. And um, yeah, I, I definitely think that uh, the, the application via drinking water is, uh, is quite important. Another application that uh, I don't see here is for example, the direct oral application. I mean, we have animals in some phases, like for example, suckling pigs that um, 
might have huge problems like for example coccidiosis but also might have problems with the uh, um, diarrhea it's gonna be difficult to apply a product via feed and so a direct oral application uh, via spraying in directly in their mouth uh, or this kind of application can also be an advantage in those phases and we know that having a healthy piglet sucking piglets that then uh, starts um, very well in the nursery phase and then gets uh, gets um, um, high average daily weight gain in the nursery phase also will impact the later phases uh, like growing and finishing. Yeah, that's interesting. So it really sounds like there's a, a, a wide variety of applications and, and uses here uh, for the different phytogenics. Uh, now that we have a little clearer picture on how this type of feed additive is being used, um, can you tell us why it's being used? What are the motivations uh, that uh, our respondents to the survey provided? So uh, let's say that um, uh, we grouped here all the motivation and um, as the respondent had the possibility to, to click on more than just one option. So um, we have here, for example, on, on one of the most important ones was the antimicrobial effect of the of the phytogenic feed additive, but also effects that we see in digestibility enhancement, growth promotion as such, um, possibility to use phytogenic feed additives in um, uh, antibiotic growth promoter replacement strategy, the anti-inflammatory effects of the uh, phytogenic feed additive, and then nutrient and sparing effect of phytogenic feed additive. I wouldn't say that here uh, one motivation excludes the other. I think they're all linked to each other. In fact, if we look at um, at uh, the antimicrobial effect, we can also uh, link this to a better antibiotic growth promoters and earth pla replacement strategy, but also the digestibility enhancement. Why? Because with the antimicrobial effect that we have out of our phytogenic feed additive, um, we have um, modulation in the gut microbiota, which means that um, we are um, shifting the microbiota towards a more beneficial microbiota, which means also that uh, having um, beneficial microbiota, we will have also the production of more um, nutrients out of, of compounds that are usually uh, less digestible for the host. And so this will also help the digestibility enhancement. And then we know, for example, that um, in a lot of um, countries, once the antibiotic uh, growth promoters were uh, taken out of the diets, what was happening was that we had big challenges uh, for example, in broilers with uh, necrotic enteritis. And here, again, the antimicrobial effect would have uh, an effect. On the other side, if we look, for example, on the anti-inflammatory uh, effect, and um, um, these can influence uh, the energy sparing and the nutrient sparing effect, which also means that, uh, uh, let's say, if I have an animal that is less, um, um, or an organism that is less busy with trying to overcome subclinical inflammation also will have much more energy for that specific organism to grow, which means the host has the more energy available for growth and uh, the performance will also be better. So again, you can see all of this is somehow linked and, uh, and actually shows us how complex the topic of phytogenic fidelity is, but also how interesting and uh, versatile it can be for our um, producers to be used. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's interesting that you mentioned these are sort of overlapping reasons and motivations, and this goes to a motive action that doesn't just point to one thing, but has multiple effects on an animal. Could you speak to direct and indirect effects, maybe, in that sense? Yeah, sure. I mean, we see, for example, um, once we use phytogenic feed additive, we always see that we have. Um, 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 improvement in digestibility so um, however we're talking about um, um, very complex uh, compounds that do not act like an enzyme so if i'm using an enzyme i know exactly what's the effect of that enzyme uh, depending on what kind of enzyme i use but if for example if i use proteases i know exactly what will be the effect on the proteins right that i'm feeding to my animal in the case of phytogenic feed additives the, the topic is a bit more complex because the digestibility enhancement comes out of, of um, different um, mode of action. On one side, I have the anti-inflammatory effects that, of course, uh, are helping me sparing energy. On the other side, I have antioxidant effects that are also helping 
um, to overcome these uh, subclinical uh, inflammation challenges. But then also I have uh, uh, the modulation of the gut microbiota. I also have direct effect on, um, on um, gut integrity, so directly on epithelial cells. And out of this, I have more nutrients that are available for my animal to grow, which means I see an enhancement of digestibility, but I will not be able to give directly a, um, um, uh, feed metrics, for example, as I'm doing with my enzymes, because it's uh, really uh, strongly dependent on um, what's going on with my animals, what kind of challenges they're facing, uh, are they really having a um, clinical uh, situation or am I having a subclinical situation. So depending on this, I will also have quite a, um, different uh, final results when using those phytogenic feed additives. All right. Um, and on that topic of digestibility, have you brought any uh, results that you could share with us along those lines? Yeah, sure. I have uh, here some results just to, to show you that it's it's very difficult to say or to give a feed, um, uh, a metrics value for, for phytogenics because there is not just one um, one parameter that I'm that I'm influencing. So here, what you can see is um, um, digesterone, the product itself. Um, in swine having an effect on the apparent uh, ileal digestibility of crude protein, fat, but also starch, calcium and phosphorus in piglets. And as you can see here, um, is that in all cases we have an improvement in digestibility and it's not just linked, for example, on digestibility of protein or just the uh, digestibility of fat. It's more or less on the overall um, um, parameters that we're looking at, which means that overall uh, the animal um, is have so overall the phytogenic feed additive is having an effect on my animals all right are there any other results that you can share with us um from the survey yeah so uh, we looked also i mean i want to um again clarify this period was a pre uh coronavirus period so uh we know that coronavirus very strong impact on uh, uh, animal production in different uh, regions. And so I, I'm aware that uh, these, uh, let's say these results might not reflect uh, what our respondents would say right now uh, as the situation is, but we um, asked our respondents what were their expectation for the use of phytogenic feed additives in the next 12 months. And um, um, we were very happy seeing that 68% uh, of the respondents actually said that uh, they would increase the use of phytogenic, 24% uh, saying the same, and just a very small amount is not sure what's going to happen or says that uh, they are going to decrease it. So um, I think the future of the phytogenic feed additive in this case is uh, very bright. That's great. Um, certainly we've, we've heard recently um, it was just the other day, in fact, we were talking with uh, Dr. Lisa Bilkey uh, about non-antibiotic ways to control necrotic enteritis, and she pointed out phytogenics as one of these categories where there is more research coming to light, and there is more experience also in the commercial uh, settings with these feed additives, so that, that it is a growing and burgeoning area of focus. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think... Um... As I was mentioning uh, before, just briefly, when uh, antibiotic growth promoters, for example, were taken out of diets, especially in broilers, um, we were facing um, different situation, also depending on, on the, the regions we were looking at. So when this happened, for example, in, uh, in North America, for sure, uh, what was happening is that um, uh, what we could see was um, um, the outbreak of uh, a lot of necrotic enteritis cases, yes. and uh, um, when there is a necrotic enteritis, we always see very good effects with phytogenic feed additives because um, we see that the phytogenic feed additives on one side have an effect uh, as um, anti-inflammatory components, but also a direct effect to improve the gut integrity, uh, which means we have stronger tight junction. And, uh, and so also the, the health of the epithelial cells um, is improved. And then we have the direct effects um, on, um, on the pathogens. This on one side, for example, if we consider that uh, um, we have um, the pre, um, 
phase uh, with the um, uh, coccidia, so we have an effect on all cysts directly, but also when then uh, the closed radiosis breaks out, we have a direct effect on closed radiosis. Again, here, depending on the severity, you might uh, need to have different kind of applications, depending also on, on the management on the farm. So um, how is vaccination against uh, coccidia done and so on? Also, depending on this, you might adapt the application of, uh, of the products uh, accordingly, but uh, we've seen very good results with the use of phytogenic feed additives. Uh, but uh, I would also like to say that uh, you cannot rely just on, on one product. So if we are looking at the different uh, programs that are used all around the world, for example, a very good combination is uh, um, helping young chick to establish a good uh, microbiota. So here it's uh, when, uh, for example, we usually suggest to have an application in the early age of the animal with uh, probiotics really to help um, the good microbiota to establish, so the beneficial microbiota to grow, and then to use at the same time the phytogenic feed additive to make sure that uh, we can get this uh, um, healthy gut in terms of gut integrity, anti-inflammatory effect, so that we we can be ready when the challenge really happens. All right, you um, have sparked uh, a few questions here on that topic, so let me uh, dig into it with a couple um, from our listeners today. Uh, you mentioned coccidiosis, uh, prevention or reduction. Uh, this, the question here is what types of essential oils or phytogenic substances more generally uh, have you seen that are beneficial or effective in reducing coccidiosis? The question here is specifically in uh, where we have a high content in uh, carvacrol, but also some thymol. We've seen good effects with that. And then extracts uh, also related to similar plants. Um, and we've seen also some results recently using saponins in this direction. So yeah, that's, uh, uh, let's say, um, a combination um, of different um, uh, concentration of these uh, compounds would be um, the biomine solution in this case. Great. Um, and you mentioned uh, stimulating beneficial uh, it's gut microbiota um, in young birds as well, I believe, um, in, in addressing the necrotic situation. Uh, can you tell us more about that? Does that mean essentially you're talking about a, a com combination of, of different types of feed additives in order to put in exactly. an effective necrotic prevention strategy? Yeah, so um, in this case, um really depending on the severity, sometimes it's not enough to rely on just one product. And what we've uh, been seeing is uh, that uh, combining the phytogenic feed additive with um, uh, probiotics, uh, so such probiotics that are actually also um, able to um, establish themselves uh, and grow in the, in the gut of the animals, uh, like uh, different enterococcus species, but also lactobacilli and so on, um, that this would help to have uh, early establishment of the gut microbiota, so help the animal um, um, get to the to the point where where the microbiota is stable. Because we all know that when we have young animals, it takes a while until uh, we have the establishment of the of the final or grown out microbiota. So using probiotics, we can help them um, in this direction, but also combining it with phytogenic feed additive, we can make sure that uh, that this transition happens much faster and in an uh, uh, even healthier way. Great. Uh, and we have another question along those lines. So I think we've essentially just sort of um, jumped uh, into our Q&A session, if that's all right for everyone. Uh, but specifically on this uh, opportunity to combine, say, a phytogenic with the probiotic. Um, the, the question here is, could essential oils uh, be detrimental uh, to the, the beneficial bacteria in the probiotic product? So uh, are they essentially harming it? Is it counterproductive to use combinations? Is there anything to watch out for uh, in using the combinations of these feed additives? This is, uh, in my opinion, a very interesting uh, question. 
uh, there is uh, no right or wrong, so I'm 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 sorry I cannot give an exact answer. But what I can say is that uh, it's uh, always depending on the concentration that I'm using, especially of uh, my phytogenic feed additives. I mean, also considering whether the probiotics is uh, uh, we're talking about uh, a live probiotic, because uh, of course when when we're talking about live bacteria, we need also to make sure that uh, uh, we're not killing them. And we have, uh, if we are having very high concentration of uh, essential oils that are usually known to be, um, to have antimicrobial effect, we might affect those. So here we really need to, to pay attention. And uh, um, I would say that uh, the most important thing I need to take into consideration is how am I, I applying uh, the, uh, the, the feed additive together. So if, if it's application in feed, usually we don't see uh, huge effects unless the, um, let's say the dosage of the phytogenic feed additive is um, um, way higher than what's actually recommended by the producer uh, themselves, um, then there might be some problems because then we're, we're playing somewhere where um, also the, the producer himself cannot give us a clear answer whether it has an effect also on the beneficial bacteria. Uh, but in general, when we're applying in the feed, we don't see this. And, and that's uh, because usually what we see also out of research is that uh, the minimum inhibitory concentration of pathogenic feed additives towards pathogenic bacteria compared to uh, more beneficial bacteria is much lower, which means I need a lower amount of phytogenic feed additive to inhibit or, or stop the growth of pathogenic bacteria compared to the positive bacteria. So there are a lot of uh, studies out there uh, where we can see that, for example, um, there is um, um, a specific um, concentration of carbacrol that would have an effect on, uh, on um, uh, bacteria like E. coli or Salmonella. But to have an effect, for example, on a lactobacillus, I need to have uh, something um, around the concentration like 15 times higher. So uh, again, here it's it's about the concentration. And usually we see that the concentration used to inhibit the growth of pathogen is lower compared to the one of beneficial bacteria. I think as long as uh, you stick to the dosages recommended by the producers in the feed, you don't have problems. Uh, what you need to pay attention is, uh, though, if you're applying them in water. So we know that when we're applying them in water, a lot of times we're uh, preparing a stock solution with those uh, compounds. So on one side with uh, the probiotics and uh, the uh, phytogenic feed additive, and sometimes we combine them together. And here I need to pay attention that uh, um, I'm not combining them at the concentration that are um, detrimental to my probiotics. So here I think, uh, never um, combine directly the two products, but always try to dilute them first and then um, always rely on what your uh, producer says related to that. So the recommendation of the supplier. Yeah, that's, um, that's interesting, uh, good advice to take to mind if, if you're using that sort of particular combination in your operation. Uh, I did want to look at Let's see, we have one more poultry question and then we'll uh, switch gears. Uh, we've also had some interest in other areas as well. Uh, this relates to replacement of ionophores or anticoccidials uh, in poultry production. So uh, do you think that it's possible to achieve the same level of effective coxie control uh, with the phytogenic as with the more conventional tools that are available? Um. It always depends, um, in my opinion, on what kind of uh, management strategy we're having. So whether we're just using ionophore or if these are combined with the uh, um, with vaccination or not, and also it depends on the uh, management situation uh, itself. Because uh, um, sometimes um, I would say it can be difficult if we're having uh, biosecurity problems or if we're having um, uh, management problems to, to just use a phytogenic feed additive. But we also had customer that uh, um, had very good, um, good uh, uh, experiences, for example, in shuttle programs where uh, they use at different times, uh, different uh, um, 
compounds like disinfectants or phytogenic fidelities. And in this case, we, we had very good feedback coming from our customers. So um, yeah, depending on the, on the situation itself, it might be possible, but we would need to look a bit uh, better in what's, going, what's happening on a specific operation um, to also find the best situation for that specific operation. Okay. Um, we have a question here about the antimicrobial effect of certain phytogenic substances. Uh, how can PFAs or do PFAs differentiate between beneficial bacteria and harmful bacteria? Is that, is that something that happens or is there an, uh, a certain type of bacteria where phytogenics are, have more effect, have a stronger effect than in other, with others? So how do you differentiate um, when we're talking about the um, uh, bacteriostatic effect? It's uh, very difficult to answer. And also in the, in the scientific community, there are um, different answers to this specific question. In general, what I've seen uh, throughout all the research we've been doing and um, also looking at different publications that are available, as I was mentioning before, is that uh, um, the minimum inhibitory concentration of, uh, of the phytochemicals that have direct uh, antimicrobial effects would be um, much lower for uh, pathogens, which means um, those uh, negative bacteria or the bacteria that we don't, don't want to have growing in our animals. And so here we see that a lower dosage is needed to stop them, uh, while a, a, higher, a higher dosage would be needed to have a similar effect on our, um, on our beneficial bacteria. But there is also a different uh, mode of action that is uh, quite interesting when it comes to uh, pathogens, which is the quorum quenching effect of, of uh, specific uh, phytochemicals. And by quorum quenching, um, it, we mean that we are actually stopping the quorum sensing. And uh, these are difficult words for those that, uh, that don't understand exactly what we're talking about, but we just need to imagine that uh, um, bacteria um, have a way to talk to each other. And uh, by talking to each other, they can sense uh, what's the size of the bacterial population. And, um, and they can also sense uh, when is the right time to attack the host. So um, specific phytochemicals have an effect on, on, on this uh, way of communicating. So they are more or less um, put in a very simplistic way. They are more or less um, blinding uh, those bacteria so that they cannot see or sense how big the group of, of a bacteria is which means that the bacteria will not uh, um, start um, en encoding specific genetic materials that is usually vir uh, for virulence. So for example, if we think about uh, some salmonella species, when they are, um, when they are uh, expressing those syringe-like proteins that they need to, um, to attack the epithelial cells so to uh, become systemic, so to enter uh, the epithelial cells, they uh, start producing those proteins when they see that the population is big enough to actually attack the host. If we are able somehow um, to, to blind them, that they don't, don't really sense how many other of, uh, of the same species are out there, they will not uh, become virulent. So they will not start expressing those, uh, uh, those syringe-like protein. And that's exactly what phytochemicals do. And this uh, um, is an effect that has been uh, extensively studied for gram-negative bacteria. So for specifically for those bacteria that are considered opportunistic. So those bacteria that are actually um, ubiquitous, but uh, uh, if they are in a low amount, you won't have uh, a problem in the host. But then if, if they overgrow uh, the other bacteria, you could see the problem. And in this case, we've seen that um, um, there is a selection towards the pathogenic bacteria rather than the beneficial bacteria. Um, however, it's also difficult to understand how do the phytochemical actually understand uh, what, why am I blocking just those negative bacteria? So it's, it's not an easy, an easy um, question to answer. Yeah, but, but certainly um, an effect that's quite useful when we're talking about yeah, yeah. application Clearly of farm enough. animals, right? Uh, and there's, as, as I've understood from my discussions over the years with scientists, there's always more to research. There's always another question uh, under investigation. Uh, 
let's let's turn the tables uh, to the world of aquaculture uh, because we've had a few questions uh, in that area. Are you witnessing uh, a usage of phytogenics in aqua diets? Is this increasing? Is this more common? Uh, what are the reasons yeah. for it? Yeah, so we've we've seen that um, they are becoming more and more popular, um, especially in the let's say Asia. Um, Asian regions, and uh, that's a lot because um, uh, the fish meal has become more and more expensive and also uh, difficult to uh, supply. And so now more and more producers are applying um, proteins from um, vegetable sources, so uh, plants. And what we see that there is that um, those um, those uh, raw materials are more difficult to uh, be digested for the host themselves. And here is where uh, choosing phytogenic feed additives that can have an impact on uh, anti-inflammatory, so that have an impact on the inflammation um, of the animals, but also uh, antioxidative effects and microbiota modulating effect can uh, positively impact um, the digestion also in aquaculture and also are very helpful when we're looking for um, restoring, like using lower digestible feeds and uh, bringing back the performance to where we were before with fish meal. So yeah, we've seen uh, this increasing a lot. Also as a uh, biomin, we um, have a lot of studies to show into in this direction with different, um, with different species. Um, so I think there is a lot of potential there, yes. Right. And um, we have another question on the aqua topic. So uh, aside from the, the ability to maybe reduce fish oil and fish meal uh, content of aqua feeds, how about uh, parasite control? Do you have any experience? Have you seen any uh, success with parasite control and phytogenics in this area? We've uh, worked ourselves also on parasite control. We have uh, uh, very good uh, data. It's um, um, from a scientific perspective, sometimes it can be very difficult to see the effects because of course, when we are having a challenge model, usually they are uh, very uh, strong models. And let's not forget that phytogenic feed additives are used more on a preventive way. So if you're actually clinically infecting those animals, um, it, it, it's not representative for what's happening in, in the field. So we are also working more and more in this direction, but we've seen some uh, some good results uh, coming from eels and uh, in Japan, for example, in parasite. We've seen some some good results um, also in uh, in sea lice, and we continue working in this direction. So yeah, I think phytogenic feed additive can have a positive inf impact. And let's let's not forget that uh, um, I mean. It's true we are talking about uh, um, aquaculture here, but there are parasites also in other uh, species. And uh, we've seen that with phytogenic feed additive, there, there can be some effects on, on um, parasites as such. I mean, let's also talk about humans, for example. I mean, who doesn't know that um, when, when kids in the past were having uh, worms, for example, what they would get was a lot of garlic. And, and that's also a, a way of using a phytogenic feed additive to overcome parasites. Yeah, a, a great practical sort of home re remedy example there. We can all maybe relate to uh, in reference. Great. Uh, we, we've covered poultry. We've covered aquaculture. Is there a, 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 a farm animal species that is best suited to phytogenics where phytogenics are more prevalent or, or they ha add more value? Or are there applications across the board? What do you think? I would say that uh, the application can be across all species. It's just a matter of identifying the right phytogenic that I want to apply for uh, a specific uh, situation. So we we cannot uh, forget that uh, these species, yeah, of course, they're all animals, but they have different challenges. And uh, also we're looking at different uh, key performance parameter. I mean, um, a product that I'm using, for example, in broiler, and it doesn't mean that it will work also for a sow, and especially depending on what I'm looking to, to, to influence on the sow. Um, for example, if I'm, if I'm looking on, on 
uh, boosting fertility or milk production in the sow, uh, I would need a different product than what I'm using in broilers when they are having necrotic enteritis. So here, um, I think um, um, it's uh, also very helpful to rely to experts that know different product and also uh, can help you to, to find the right product to address uh, the specific key performance parameter. Because I've seen a lot of time um customers uh having specific expectation and using some product and not reaching those expectation because they were not looking at the correct application so it always depends it's the same thing when i'm looking at uh, at uh, for example average daily weight gain of piglets we know that the average daily weight gain of piglets is very important because if you have heavy piglets um during um um, so at the beginning, but during the whole nursery phase, you can you can get those pigs to gain weight. You know that they will take this um, growth also towards all the growth finisher phase, which means um, they will get um, uh, they will finish faster more or less. And so also here, when I'm when I'm thinking about piglets, what am I thinking about? I'm thinking about animals that. Uh, change of environment that start getting um, um, solid feed. So I need to get them on the feed quickly. I need to, to boost their feed intake, but then also on the other side, I need to, to help them um, um, establishing a healthy gut so that they can also uh, easily digest what they are getting. So here, uh, again, I would, I would look more on a combination of um, um, herbs, and spices that also increase this feed intake that might not be needed, for example, when I'm actually looking at the finisher. Because in a finisher, what I'm looking at is I need to have the correct uh, feed to gain ratio. So I'm actually lo looking at reducing this feed conversion. Um, so yeah, it, it, it really depends on what is the performance parameter I want to target. And uh, um, that's why actually phytogenic feed additive can be applied on different uh, species in different phases, but I really need to understand what do I need to reach and then um, have the correct uh, compounds to reach that specific parameter? Great. Um, now, for we're getting close to the end of our session here. For those of us in our audience who are still interested in finding out more, we've had uh, requests about uh, field trials, more information, how to identify the right product for their specific operation. Uh, where can they get that information? Well, um, of course, they can always rely to uh, the sales uh, managers in the country directly, and uh, they will have them find uh, whatever information they need. Uh, they can um, have a look at uh, different um, um, uh, magazines where there are always um, new articles about phytogenic feed additive, but I would say um, especially for us in Biomain, it's always good to get in touch with the uh, sales manager in the regions and they will uh, always uh, find the, the right answer, either because getting in contact with the headquarter and the product management of Phytogenic or because they already know the answer. Right, absolutely. So that's a um, global technical and commercial force. Biomain is deployed uh, in over 120 countries throughout the world. Always here to support you. Um, Antonia, I also note you've touched on a couple of topics that are quite interesting. I just wanted to note them uh, for our listeners today. Uh, your team, you and your team have been working on uh, some new results that are going to be published regarding oral application, which is something you mentioned, and also yeah. the results of phytogenics in the young animals, in terrestrial species. So those yeah. will all be available soon in the, in the coming weeks on biomin.net. You can sign up to receive that information when it's available and of course to contact your biomin representative if you're looking for that contact you can uh, go ahead and fill out our feedback survey from today's session as we uh, roll round down this hour uh, please take a moment just to answer us to let us know your feedback on the discussion today what you liked what you'd like to hear more of in the future so we can improve on these uh, as we go forward you'll also be able to check a box to say I'd like to get in contact with the Bioman representative. Dr. Taconi, thank you for your time today. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much, Ryan. I want to thank all of our listeners uh, for your questions, for your attention, uh, for your engagement. And we look forward to speaking to you soon on behalf of Bioman. I want to thank you. Have a good day.
Bye.